I'm thankful tonight to be pastor of a church that I honestly feel cares about others. Your thoughtfulness sometimes amazes me. When Billy Joe mentioned this morning about some of Walena's class going back in the office, talking to her on the telephone while she was in the hospital. That's just wonderful. I had to nudge Kenny when she said that. I said, isn't that wonderful? People be that thoughtful. You know her heart was here and she couldn't be here. And what it must have meant to her to talk to some of those in her class. I thank God tonight for his wonderful goodness to us. Let's bow our heads for a moment of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we're so unworthy of thy goodness to us tonight. Could never begin to merit all the blessings could never begin to deserve all the grace that has been extended to us. We thank you tonight and we praise you tonight for being so mindful of us. We ask in these next few moments that your Holy Spirit will have right of way in every heart. We're glad, Lord, we can come to church with expectation. Not really knowing what's going to happen. But when your presence is here like it is tonight, we know that there's going to be blessings. And there's going to be encouragement and inspiration. And we bless your name for that tonight. We pray that you'll touch us afresh and anew and help us to speak that which you have laid on our hearts tonight. We thank you for helping us this morning. For the beauty of this day, as someone mentioned, for the good food we've enjoyed, for clothing to wear, a shelter, transportation, health, strength, friends, loved ones. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Cometh down from the Father of lights, in whom is neither shadow nor turning. Thank you for loving us with an everlasting love. And help us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> I want to read tonight from the book of Matthew, chapter 19. There's something about this story in the Bible that keeps coming back to me and is so sad. It makes me wonder different times. And I hope that God will use this story tonight to help us. Matthew, chapter 19, and starting at verse 16. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. He saith unto him, Which? And Jesus said, Thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The young man saith unto him, All these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? And Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor. And thou shalt have treasures in heaven, and come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. In the Bible, we can see on many different occasions what someone would have missed if they had not obeyed the Lord. And the reason we can see what they missed is because we have the record. I think of Moses when God said, Moses, I want you to go down into Egypt and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. 
Now we have the record of what happened because Moses obeyed. Even though he didn't want to go at first. When he finally obeyed, we have the record of all of the things that transpired. Had he not gone, we wouldn't have known what he missed or would have missed. We have the record of the miraculous way that God delivered the Israelites by sending the ten plagues. We have the parting of the Red Sea that he would have missed. We have the manna from heaven in the wilderness, symbolic of Jesus, who is the bread of life. We have the water from the rock in Horeb, which is symbolic of Jesus, who is the water of life. We have so many miracles that took place because Moses obeyed the Lord. Moses would have missed all of that if, if he had not done what God said to do. And he didn't want to go in the first place. We have the record of what Jonah would have missed had he not gone to Nineveh. Nineveh was an exceeding great city of 120,000 people. And when Jonah finally got there, and you know the story of Jonah, when he finally got there and preached the message that God told him to preach, the whole city got saved from the king on down. Every man, woman, and child. Saved, repented in sackcloth and ashes. He would have missed that had he not done what God said to do. And by the way, he didn't want to go either. Isn't it strange how sometimes we think we know best and we think we know more than God? Now, I thank God tonight for the times that I have obeyed him. I haven't always obeyed him. But I thank God for the times that I have. Because I can see what I would have missed if I had not done what he said. Just a little illustration. Yesterday I had a wedding to perform. A couple that had been living together decided to get married. And I said, yes, 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 I'll marry you. <laughs> and... Uh, they don't have much of this world's goods, and I'm sure they're on welfare to a large degree. And on the way down, Doris asked me what I was going to do with the money that they gave, give me for performing the ceremony. And I said, well, it's been going through my mind ever since I left the house that I'll give it back to them for a wedding present from you and I. She said, that's fine. I had no way of knowing what or how much it would be. But that's what I felt impressed of God to do. And so after the wedding was performed and I had the license all filled out and the family was all gathered around there, and I'm not sure if it was his father or her father. I wasn't that well enough acquainted with them, but it was one of them. He was standing right beside us. And when I handed him the license and I said, uh, everything's all filled out and, uh, and here's your license. And the husband took a $10 bill and put it in my hand. And I said, now wait just a minute. And I said, uh, Doris and I want to give you this for a wedding present from us. And he said, thank you. And just as he took that, I'm not sure if it's his dad or her dad, but he reached over and socked something down in my pocket. And I walked out. And I thought to myself, I guess this is mine because I gave them what they gave me. And I think that's what the Holy Spirit told me to do. But I couldn't hardly wait to get a loan to see what that was. And Sister Billy, it was a $20 bill. On the way out the door, I didn't know what was in there. But as soon as he put that in there, that scripture popped into my mind, give and it shall be given you. You see, I, on the way home, I said, God, <laughs> that's the quickest. That's the quickest it has ever been given back to me when I gave something. Because no sooner did that 10 leave my hand till that 20 went in this pocket. <laughs> now, I would have missed that if I had allowed greed 
or selfish motive to overrule the Holy Spirit. And by the way, the Holy Spirit is subject to our will. You see, the Bible says, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. And if we don't do that, God cannot lead us, God cannot direct us, and we'll not do what he says. But that's just a little illustration that just happened yesterday. But I, I think time and time again, what we would miss if we didn't do what God said. It's a strange thing to me that God has no problem with his creation in the birds of the air and the fish of the sea and the beast of the field and nature itself and the eclipse that took place a while back, wasn't it right on time, right to perfection? You see uh, how, how beautiful things are when they do what God wants them to do. And how beautiful the flowers are when they bloom. And how beautiful our lives can be when we live for him. Boy, I tell you that. But this rich young ruler, good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? He was very, very rich. I'm sure he would have been willing to pay a great price of money or gold or silver or possessions to have this. But Jesus said, sell what you have and give to the poor and you will have treasures in heaven and come and follow me. And he said, I, I, can't, I can't do that much. I can't give that much. But you see, when we're not saved, we see things totally different than from the way they really are. You see, before I got saved, I didn't want to go to church. I wanted to go to the nightclubs and play in the band. I wanted to play baseball on Sunday afternoon. I wanted to do so many things, but church was the last thing I would have chosen to do. I got saved 2.30 Sunday morning. And guess where I went? seven o'clock Sunday night to church I wanted to go my want to change I saw things in a different light now and the things I said I can't give up the nightclub I can't give this up I can't but after I got saved it was no problem at all to take the pen and paper and write six letters to all the band members and so you'll have to get you another guitar player I got saved last night. And from now on, I'll be singing and playing for the Lord Jesus Christ. And my friend, from the, from the, from the dance floor the night before, from the bandstand the night before, playing the songs of the world, the following night, Sunday night, I stood in the pulpit at the Heron Church of God and sang, I'd rather be on the inside looking out than to be upon the outside looking in and right in the middle of that song I had to stop and the tears filled my eyes because I realized I am on the inside looking out when you get saved now I want to prove that this rich young man said I can't pay that much of a price I just can't and the Bible says he went away sorrowful for he had great riches I'm sure he would have given some. I'm sure he would have given much. But Jesus knew that his heart was wrapped up in wealth. And his wealth meant more to him than eternal life that he was seeking for. And he went away sorrowful. Now I want to show you something. Another rich man named Zacchaeus. He was very rich. A tax collector. And a crooked one at that. By his own admission, he had gained his wealth by false accusation, with deception. I mean, when he went to a home and, and they owed a certain amount of taxes, he said, you owe this amount instead of the amount that they really owed. And all above that went into his pocket. And that's how he accumulated his wealth. And he's the little fellow that the kids sing about. 
Zacchaeus was a wee little man, a wee little man was he. Climbed up in the sycamore tree, the Savior for to see. And when the Savior passed that way, he looked up in the tree. And he said, Zacchaeus, come down, for I'm going to your house today. Zacchaeus did come down. And Zacchaeus accepted Christ as his personal Savior. And what's the first thing he did? He said, Behold, Lord, half of my goods I give to the poor. You can do it. You can do it. If I've taken anything from any man by false accusation, I'll restore him four times as much. My dad used to say, if a Jew can give 50%, surely us Gentiles can give 10%. Think of that. Think of it. He was a changed person. He went home that day and Jesus was his guest and he invited his friends and told them. The rich man, the rich young ruler, went away sorrowful because he would not do what Jesus said. We don't even know his name. And I often wonder, what was God's plan for his life? What would we have read about if he had been willing to do what Jesus said? How many others would he have influenced being a rich young ruler in the prime of life? How many could he have influenced? How many could he have brought to Christ? And yet, because he would not do what Jesus said, we don't even know his name. But we know Zacchaeus' name. And we know Jonah's name. And we know Moses' name. Why? Because they did what God said for them to do. I praise God for that tonight. God asks some to do great things, but nothing greater than what he will help them to do. Egypt was a great kingdom, the greatest on the face of the earth at that time. It was said of the wisdom and knowledge of Egypt that there were ten known wisdoms in the world at that time, and Egypt possessed nine of them. A vast, great kingdom ruled by Pharaoh. And God said, Moses, I want you to go to Egypt, to the palace of the king, and tell him to let my people go. Thus saith the Lord. Nineveh was an exceeding great city of 120,000 people. Someone says, Brother Daniel, that was a great thing for God to ask him to do. That was a big thing. But the Bible says, he that's faithful in that which is least is also faithful in that which is much. So God may not ask us to go to Egypt. He may not ask us to go to Nineveh. He says to children, obey your parents. That's not a very big thing, is it? Couldn't kids do that? We have examples in the Bible. David, a teenager, and his father, Jesse, said, Son, I want you to take this cheese and this corn and this bread and go down to the field of battle and take it to your brothers and see how they're getting along. Now, the average teenager of today, oh, man, I got other things to do. I'm going out with a gang. I'm going to chill out, you know, whatever that means. I hear all these jargons nowadays. I'm just chilling. Just chilling. Huh? I think that first saying come out by the hippies, I'm not sure that. Cool it. Cool it. Hey, man, cool it. I think that means take it easy or settle down or keep your shirt on. But cool it. All this jargon. But, but David was a, was a teenager. And yet when dad asked him to go down to the place of battle, he obeyed his father. That's what God instructed him to do. Obey your parents. Now look what he would have missed if he hadn't gone. See, we know what he would have missed. We know the giant was there. We know the battle that took place. We know that David took his sling and slew the giant and saved his nation that day. But he would have missed that if he hadn't obeyed the Lord. Saul, before he was king of Israel, a young man whose father's name was Kish, one day the mules got lost, and his father said, Son, I want you to go find the mules. They're lost. And he obeyed his father. 
And that's all that God asks of the young people. Obey your parents. In the Lord. Honor your father and your mother. That your days may be long upon the earth. See you can do what God says. And I wonder what many many children have missed. Because they wouldn't obey God. The day came. When Saul was looking for those mules, he went a long ways from home. He didn't just go out and take a quick look around. He went, he journeyed until he found them. And on the journey, he came in contact with a judge of Israel named Samuel. Got acquainted with him. And later on, when Israel began to clamor for a king, they said, other nations have got king. God, we want a king. Samuel, we want a king. Pray to God that we can have a king like other nations. And when Samuel asked God, God, whom shall I anoint? Guess who it was? That young man who had obeyed his father, Saul. Anoint Saul, king of Israel. So many people have missed so much because they grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Times when the Holy Spirit urges us to obey him and we don't do it. And we feel down. We feel defeated. We're discouraged. We know we've disobeyed God. But more than that, we don't know what we missed. That's the saddest part about it. I visited in the home of a young couple one time several years ago. Kenny had been saved just a short while. And I still remember him telling me this. I was there when it happened, and I saw what happened, but I didn't know what led up to it. I was at this man's home at almost midnight the night before. I was telling him about Jesus. And on the floor, on my knees, he was sitting in the chair, and I was down by the hassock, and I said, please trust Christ as your Savior tonight. He can help your home. They were having problems. I said, he can straighten things out. Let him come into your life. And tears were in his eyes, but he would not yield. But the next morning, Sunday morning, he came to church with his wife. Sat way back there in the back. I preached the sermon that God gave me, and when we stood to sing, God nudged this guy right over here to go back to him and invite him to the altar. And Kenny said, uh, I don't know if I can do that. Hmm? Now listen, if God is really in it, and that's what Kenny did. He said, God, if this is really you, have the song director to sing page 162. There's room at the cross for you. He said, I thought that would get me off the hook. <laughs> And he said, when we stood and I had my book, the song director walked to the microphone and said, let's all turn to page 162. And Kenny said, oh, no. And we began to sing. I never will forget it. He said, I walked back to him. I saw him walking back. Put his hand on this guy's shoulder. He said, I've never done this before. But I just wondered if you'd like to be saved this morning. And the young man dropped his head and said, yes, I would. And they came down the aisle together. And that young man got saved that morning. And boy, when he told about that, he couldn't hardly tell it without floating on the clouds. But he would have missed that if he hadn't have just done what God said to do. You see, it's such a blessing to tell others. But there are battles that we fight within ourselves when God impresses us. And we must give over to the Holy Spirit. Or we're going to miss something. Have you ever been in a service and Sister Billy said, does anybody have a praise testimony this morning? And the Holy Spirit nudged you and you didn't move. And you felt like you should, but you didn't move. Do you have any idea what you may have missed? And do you have any idea what you may have caused us to miss? Huh? Now, it's such a blessing when you do it. And you feel good. And his old, old brother, uh, what's his name? That fellow that used to pastor at Carrie Mills. He's got a brother in Murfreesboro named Homer. 
His name was Richards, Homer Rich Tom Richards used to pastor in Karen Mills, and we had a community service one time, and he was chairing it, and he was conducting a testimony service, <laughs> and he's having a hard time getting anybody up. And pretty soon he said, now listen, folks, you don't have to go home with the thumps tonight. He said, y'all know what the thumps are, don't you? He said, that's when the Holy Spirit's nudging you to testify and your old heart goes thump, 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 thump. And you know you ought to get up. And the more you hold back, the louder it thumps. And if you, if you don't do what God wants you to do, you go out the door with the thumps. And you'll have them all night long. And he said, don't go home with the thumps. Now, that may sound a little bit comical, but it's the truth. It's the truth. I have wondered at times where I would be right now if I hadn't come to West Frankfurt. I really have at times. Sometimes like after a service this morning or prayer meeting Wednesday night and I'm walking back home and I'm singing in my heart. I'm thinking about all of you people and I'm praising God and I think about Kenny and Don who are here with me and I think about my loved ones and my friends I think about how much you have loved us how much you have loved my wife my kids my relatives and there's times when I think God I would have missed all of this if I hadn't done what you said I would have missed it. I want to close this service tonight by asking anyone here tonight who might have a testimony. Now, I'm not trying to give you the thumps. But maybe there is a time in your life when you did what God told you to do. And it turned out to be such a blessing, not only to you, but to others around you. It affected a lot of people. Or maybe you'd just like to thank God tonight for his goodness to you. I know we had several testimonies this morning, and we've had a few tonight. But it just felt impressed that maybe there's someone. Maybe you haven't testified in quite a while. And maybe you'd just like to thank God. Because you know of some things that you would have missed had you not done what he said. Thank God for the nudgers. Amen. <laughs> you know, that little thing in the bulletin this morning said, uh, happy is the person who can laugh at himself or something. who always has something to laugh about or can make us laugh. And we was eating dinner today and I got tickled and started laughing because I thought about what I said this morning in the middle of that sermon when I said there's something, some things that are worse than being married. <laughs> And I didn't catch it right at first. And then when I thought about it at dinner, I got so tickled. I thought, I meant to say then, then not being married. And I thought, boy, I wonder how that sounded to everybody. And, uh, but I'm glad that uh, we're human and God understands that. But as long as we're sincere and trying to do what he wants us to do, his blessings and his spirit. <laughs> Probably will. Is there any others?